As we look to God's word this morning, we continue our series that we've been in the last several months entitled Disciple as we learn what it means to embrace the teachings of Jesus together as a church community. We're going to look at another parable, two parables in particular, that we find in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. This is a chapter that we've been in the last few weeks. We'll look together at the parable of the wheat and weeds and look together at the parable of the mustard seed. We look at Matthew chapter 13 verses 24 through 32 and then skipping down to 36 through 43. The word of God says, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed the good seed in the field, but while the men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed the weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then do you want us to go gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat among them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into the barn. He put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. That a man took and sowed in the field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Skip down to verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and the disciples came to him, saying, Explain the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. An enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Thank goodness for good explanations by our Savior. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, that's Jesus, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. I had an aunt, a great aunt, who you might say suffered with a little OCD. You would go into her closet at any given time, at any given day, and all of her garments were exactly one inch apart. No, literally. She would take a ruler and measure her garments so that they were exactly one inch apart. The garments were not only one inch apart, but the garments were categorized by seasons, for she grew up and lived up north and even color coordinated. Now we laugh at something so trivial as organizing the chaos of a closet, but deep down inside, all of us at some level want to control the chaos in our life and want to control the chaos of our world. You see, for most of us, we cannot stand for things to be out of order. We can't stand for things to be chaotic. We live in a world where we can't help but be faced with chaos and disorder and suffering and tragedy every single day. Most recently, we turn on the news and we see the chaos and the destruction and the darkness of what happened to the Bahamas. And while we are grateful that God spared us, our joy is somehow muted when we see the chaos and destruction of our brothers and sisters just east of us. You see, for 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ has prayed, your kingdom come. For 2,000 years, the church has prayed, thy will be done on earth, where? As it is in heaven. 
But do you ever get so disillusioned? Do you ever become so wearied by the chaos and the brokenness, you actually ask yourself, is it really true? Is your kingdom really being brought to earth as it is in heaven? Is your kingdom really advancing, God? Does shining my little light actually make any difference in the world? I don't know about you, but I would go crazy living this life, and I would go crazy living in this world if it wasn't for the truth of what Jesus teaches us here in Matthew chapter 13. You and I would go absolutely crazy trying to make sense of the chaos and darkness and brokenness and evil in this world if it wasn't for the great truth here in Matthew chapter 13 concerning the kingdom of heaven. Everywhere Jesus went, he announced that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So let's believe it to be true. What does Jesus teach us here in Matthew 13 concerning this kingdom? The first thing that I wanna point out in this parable is that the kingdom of heaven is an all-encompassing kingdom. It is not small, but it is big. It is not narrow, but it is wide. And to see that, I want us to look at the explanation portion of this parable as it's recorded in verses 37 through 43. You see, this parable concerning the kingdom of heaven is a reaction to the culture. It's a reaction to what they were hoping for in the days of Jesus. What were they hoping for? The Jews of Jesus' day were hoping, based on a prophetic hope, in a Messiah that would come to rid the world of evil. Doesn't sound too bad. Sounds like something we hope in. The problem is their focus was so narrow that they thought the evil that Messiah had come to rid the world of was the Roman Empire. They thought that Rome was the evil that the kingdom of God had come to abolish. And what Jesus is trying to teach here in this parable is your understanding of the kingdom is so narrow and it is so small. My kingdom is all-encompassing. My kingdom is wider. And this is what Jesus is trying to teach them in the explanation. That the evil is not Rome. It is not Pontius Pilate. It is not the emperor. But the evil is the enemy who comes who is what? The devil. You see, what Jesus is trying to teach them is you have cancer and you want to scratch the dirt underneath your fingernail and say it's all better. I've come to say that I need to bring people back to life. That I need to not rid the world of the Roman Empire, but I need to remove all evil from top to bottom in this world. My kingdom is all-encompassing. My kingdom is comprehensive. My kingdom is bigger than anything you could have ever imagined. What Jesus is attempting to do here in this explanation is explain you have a bigger problem than Rome. It is called the evil in your heart. You have a bigger problem than the Roman Empire. It is called sin. I have not come to abolish a worldly kingdom. I have come to do battle with the spiritual forces of darkness and evil in this world and to make all things new. That is the nature of the kingdom of God. And so while we might be tired of waiting for God to make all things new, make no mistake that Jesus is on a mission through the people of God to make all things new from top to bottom, to rid the world of all evil, of cancer, and of death, and of hurricanes, and of cerebral palsy, and of Alzheimer's, and of brokenness, and everything that has separated humanity from God, from the garden, God has come to abolish once and for all. That is the nature of the all-encompassing, comprehensive kingdom of God. And in relaying and explaining this parable about what the kingdom of heaven is all about, what does Jesus do for us? He gives us the end of the story, doesn't he? In verse 41 and 43, he explains what happens at the end. He says in verse 41, he says in the end, at the end of the age in verse 40, and then in verse 41, the son of man, Jesus, will send his angels and gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers. And so what Jesus is communicating, in the end, evil will be defeated and the kingdom of light will prevail. The kingdom of heaven will win. 
And then at the very end, verse 43, the, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of what? Their father. Jesus doesn't say the kingdom of God. He doesn't say the kingdom of heaven. He says the kingdom of their father. Don't miss how personal and warm and endearing Jesus is trying to be there. That the father embraces his children as sons, the righteous sons that will shine, will be gathered in the end. Why is this significant to understand the nature of the kingdom? Why is Jesus giving the end of the story? Because it's the only thing that will help you live in the middle of the story. I once knew of somebody who would refuse to read a book until she read the last chapter of the book. If she liked the last chapter of the book, she would then proceed to read the entire book, but she wanted to ensure that the ending was good. She wanted to make sure that the end, the end of the story was worth reading. Well, that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He's giving us in verses 41, 42, and 43, the end of the story of the kingdom of God to allow people who are living in the midst of life, in the middle of the story, to have good cheer, to keep your head lifted high, because although it seems so dark and so broken and seems like it's a waste of times, I have to admit as a pastor, every day I struggle with this truth. Is the church at work and is it working? Is this gospel changing anybody's life? Is the church changing anything? Is the kingdom truly advancing? And what Jesus gives here is that the kingdom of God in the end will prevail, and that is good news. It's the end of the story that allows us to live in, in the middle of the story. What's the one thing that all three parables, the two parables that we read, have in common? Whether it's the parable of the wheat, or the parable of the mustard seed, it's all about waiting. The seed does not grow overnight. And so the people of God are people that are called to wait and wait and wait and wait. And why do we wait? Because we know how the story will end. Secondly, we not only see that this kingdom is an all-encompassing kingdom from top to bottom, eradicating sin and evil and darkness once and for all, but second point, it is a coexisting kingdom Let's go back to the parable itself. In verses 24 through 30, Jesus shares with them this parable. And he says, you have a sower, which is Jesus, and you have a field. And the sons that are sowing the good seed are who? They're the children of the kingdom of God. And you have the sons that are sowing the weeds. And they are part of the kingdom of the enemy. And then the enemy sneaks in at night. Who's the what? The devil. He comes in the darkness of the night to, to destroy to destroy that which is good. But what is Jesus trying to do here? Jesus doesn't rush and say, yes, absolutely. Get rid of the weeds. Get rid of them. What is Jesus saying? He says, leave the weeds. Let the wheat grow over here and let the weeds grow over there. And I know there is some of you, including myself at times, that say, Jesus, enough is enough. Pull the weeds out now. Come down from heaven and stop all evil and all darkness and all destruction now. But Jesus says, no, let it grow. Let it be. Let the weeds grow up and let the wheat grow up together. And what Jesus is trying to teach here is there are coexisting competing kingdoms that God allows in his sovereign will, that God allows in his sovereignty to allow the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the enemy to coexist. Why is this important for us to understand this nature of coexisting kingdoms? Because it's the only thing that will make sense of evil. It allows you and me to not be disillusioned when we turn on the TV and we go, not again. There can't be another story. There can't be another tragedy. There can't be another bout of suffering for you yourself, even in your life. It allows you to not be disillusioned when, when it just seems so overwhelming and it seems like you just can't take another bad report or another bad diagnosis or another bad message or another bad incident in your life. It allows you to say, this is the will of God, that there will be evil and there will be brokenness and there will be darkness. The wheat and the weeds coexist and grow up together. So church, don't be disillusioned. It teaches us the patience of God, that God is a God who is patient and long-suffering. In fact, in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, 
verse 9, it says, but do not overlook this one, no, sorry. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, here's the truth. We should not want God to rush because it is the patience of God and the patience of God alone that has prevented God from wiping North America off the map a long time ago. It is the reason that you are here today, that if it was not for the long-suffering patience of God, you and I do not stand a chance. So we need to, in our haste of saying, God, when are you going to come? When are you gonna destroy evil once and for all? We need to thank God for his patience and long-suffering because that is exactly how he has worked in your life. And if it wasn't for the long-suffering and patience of God in your life, you and I, we wouldn't stand a chance. So in light of God's patience and suffering, long-suffering towards us, may we wait and wait and wait with long-suffering and all patience. And then lastly, the kingdom of heaven is all-encompassing. The kingdom of God is coexisting. And then lastly, the kingdom of God is ever-expanding. In verse 31 and 32, Jesus tells of the parable of the, of the mustard seed. And what is Jesus communicating here? He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain, a mustard seed that a man took and sowed. Verse 32, we're told that it's the smallest of all seeds. But when it's grown together and larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nest in its branches. What in the world is Jesus saying here? He says, there's a mustard seed that goes in the ground, it becomes a tree, and all the birds come. How does that help you and I this morning? What is a tree in the Old Testament? A tree in the Old Testament was always synonymous with the nation of Israel. Who were the birds? The birds are the Gentile nations. What is Jesus saying here about the kingdom of God? That it starts like a little nation, a people, and it turns into a tree in which will be a blessing for the entire world. You see, the kingdom of God starts as a tiny seed, a mustard seed that sometimes can't even be seen. And we wonder in our lives, can it be traced? Can it be seen? Can it advance at all and make any difference whatsoever? And God says it goes in the ground and it becomes a tree in which the whole nations, all of the nations of the world will be blessed. This is the nature of the kingdom of God that when we least expect it, it is advancing and growing and expanding. As much as we doubt, as much as we fear, as much as we become disillusioned, have faith that God leads. Lead on, O King Eternal, that he marches on with the kingdom and with the people of the kingdom of God. Now, do you think Rome 2,000 years ago would have ever thought in a million years what the kingdom of God would turn into? Did the, do you think Rome for one second thought that this ragamuffin group of disciples would ever turn into what it has in the last 2,000 years? A seed. A group of men and women against all odds launched a movement that has spread from 12 to 500 to billions of people worshiping the name of Jesus Christ and who belong to the kingdom of heaven this morning. And that is the good news, the ever expanding kingdom of God. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If it was not for Christianity, if it was not for the movement of Christianity, what would this world look like? It was Christianity that fought against infanticide and abortion. It was Christianity that fought against the oppression of women and children. It was Christianity that established societies that valued liberty and human flourishing. We built the first hospitals, built the first orphanages, built the first pharmacies, built the first schools, and I could go on and on and on and on. A little mustard seed wants a revolution and a movement that we could have never, ever anticipated 2,000 years ago. Why? Why do we push against the darkness? Because we know the end of the story. A couple was coming back from their vacation and they were seated in the airplane. 
And at the very end, before the doors were going to close, they got what every couple that is wishing for some peace and quiet never wants to see. Two adult females and three little children running down the aisle. And where were they seated? Right in front of them. They looked to themselves and said, this is not going to be a peaceful plane ride home. And lo and behold, the children were fighting, biting each other, throwing things at each other, would not stop talking, yelling, crying the entire ride home. Well, with one hour left in the trip, the little girl started screaming at the top of her lungs because her ears were hurting so much. And so one of the adult women picked up the child and tried to console her as best as she could. And to make matters worse, not only did the child begin to scream because of her ears hurting, but she began to get sick and there was a mess all over the airplane. And since we just ate, I'll spare you the details of the mess, but let's just say it was a Pampers type of mess. And not knowing what to do and the couple looking at themselves and absolutely besides themselves and watching this woman holding this young child in the midst of this mess, we, the couple sees the flight attendant running down the aisle with paper towels and wipes in her hand and says, hopefully this will help clean up your child. Well, the woman looks at the flight attendant and says, it's not my child. And the flight attendant says, well, hopefully this will help you clean up your child's friend, or your friend's child. And she goes... She's not my friend. I've never met her until we got on this plane. I'm just trying to practice what it means to love your neighbor. Needless to say, the couple was shocked. But are you shocked? We shouldn't be. Because this is exactly what God has done for us. You see, the whole message of Christianity is the story of God coming down. Where? Into our mess. The whole story of Christianity is God coming down in the person of Jesus Christ and saying, I will roll up my sleeves and come and enter into your brokenness and into your darkness and into your hopeless state and bring the light. Through my long suffering and through my patience, Jesus will lay down his life for you. This is the fruit of the message of Christianity. Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Have you experienced in your mess, have you experienced in your condition this morning the sweetness of Jesus? In a few minutes, we're gonna close in prayer. And you can pray to this God that through Jesus Christ, although your sin be great, his grace is greater. And in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of your shame, in the midst of your doubt, in the midst of your mess, in which you call your life, would you allow Jesus to come in and make things clean and make things whole and make all things new? You and I might, might not be called to build an orphanage in Ghana, but you are called to enter the mess every day. Every day you wake up, you're called to enter the mess. What will you do? We are not called to be people who are pessimistic about the future but people that have a hopeful outlook. Why? Because we know the end of the story. Let's live in light of it. Amen?